Hello ladies and gents, chicos, chicas, I hope that your sleep schedule has been somewhat fixed uh, with the rest day. Of course, down under we are having a jolly good time because usually at the time when I wake up uh, early in the morning, if I wake up early in the morning, that's when the games come to their end, so it works uh, pretty well here, but uh, Europe must be having it pretty rough. Anyway, yeah, round five um, and recap time it is. Two decisive games on the menu, the two decisive games from the men's section today, kicking off with Firuja against Hikaru. The opening already was a... Uh, Expected unexpected twist if you will because we are headed for what is probably the most popular opening nowadays on top level Which is uh, this uh, quiet um, Italian the Giaco Piano and uh, after b4 bishop e7 believe it or not We are into the game of seven moves and we are already on uncharted territory That's one of the greatest beauties of chess that no matter how many games are played on a daily basis Especially now with the online boom We still explore new ways new path new theories um it's just a breathtaking uh, thing about chess and something I really do like. Um, yeah, Queen B3 and we are already out of book. Um, Queen B3 is part of uh, certain theoretical ideas later on, but not in this particular position. Now, that's not a criticism or a praise. It's just a move like any other. Uh, A4, obviously black uh, is perfectly safe against B5 because of the knight A5 jump. Now forking queen bishop. Often this pawn aims to go all the way to A5 to take care of that. D6, knight D7 and knight B8. Now Hikaru introduces uh, Yula Breyer's absolutely insanely cool idea from the Rui Lopez into the Giaco Piano. So the idea here is actually different from uh, the Breyer's idea in the Rui Lopez because there, after a quick knight d7, black very often aims to play c5, whereas here Hikaru is going to opt for a c6 based setup. So let's slow down a little bit, d4. Firuja is trying to be very thematic and when the piece abandons the center, he immediately aims to conquer the center. Take c5, uh, d4, knight bd7 also looked uh, okay, but I think Hikaru's choice is more thematic. Takes a5, biting into this pawn formation as well. Um, now b5 would have been actually an interesting idea, and this is where the point comes. d5, um, biting once again into the center just with perfect and impeccable timing. Um, and now, of course, after takes, this pileup becomes very, very clumsy. And the double isolated pawns are very much in the way of uh, a fair number of white pieces. In particular, the diagonals are very awkwardly obstructed. And black is actually a little bit ahead here already because uh, the piece um, formation for on the black side is very harmonious, whereas the white... Uh, Development actually has a lot to be desired. So yeah, that was the plan and Firuji of course saw this coming So he intercepted this by throwing in e5 inviting further Complications he kind of opted for knight h5. I really like the idea here of d5 um, With the concept of takes 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 check queen blocks and believe it or not, but here after the queen trade, which is more or less forced, you would think that white is just a piece up. But this is not the end of the story at all, because we have this cheeky c3 move. And if knight e4, then after a takes b4, black has got these connected passes and a few very delicious diagonals for the light squared bishop um, to roam the board. And it turns out that black is actually... Very close to be winning here, about 1.6 according to the engine. And so the best response to this c3 move is to resolve the queen side tension, sack the piece back. And now it is a position where I would more than likely prefer um, white because of a potential c5 pressure. The pawn on uh, a5 is a little bit awkwardly uh, hanging. But objectively speaking, of course, this is a very much equal position. Now, instead, Hikaru went for knight h5, demonstrating some awesome spiting, uh, spiting, fighting spirit instead of the spiting spirit. Um, keeping all the pieces on the board, keeping all the tensions on the board, and in fact, 
adding a new layer of complexity. So shout out to the American for playing, you know, for not for a draw very clearly, but for just simply complicated positions. G3, D5. Once again, the good old reflex of once a piece is hanging, we tend to move it away. Of course, knight g2 check was possible, but now after king e2 that knight is not going to see the day of flight, even the light of day uh, again. So d5 was the very logical punch, counter punch, and now gf dc, queen takes, and bishop f5 uh, is what nightmares on the light squares are uh, written for, or I don't know how to finish that sentence, but you get my gist. It is a tragic sight to see the white position on the light colored complex, especially after knight d7, knight b6, and then ultimately knight d5. This is no bueno. So, uh, yeah, uh, bishop f1 was pretty much forced. And after knight e6, bishop g2, uh, we end up in a, a position that no one, I guess, would have ever guessed that this occurred from a Italian. In fact, there are a few variations in um, one of the Queen's Indian lines, believe it or not, that look quite a bit like this with an additional B6, of course, thrown in. So D4 openings result in structures like this, uh, at least as often, especially with the Fianchetto, as a uh, 1E41, especially an Italian. So crazy stuff. Now, Hikaru has some problems to solve here. Uh, with the queen side pieces, and I must say that the way how Hikaru plays the next 10 to 15 moves is absolutely impeccable. C6 challenges immediately at the pawn formation and knight d7, the horse is coming to b6. I would like to highlight that the engine doesn't quite like this move, but I also would like to highlight that every single move that the engine likes is more or less ugly. For the human eye, the, out of the three, the two most prominent one are bishop d7, yucks, attacking b5, and knight c7, also yucks, with the same idea of challenging b5 any further. They are very logical, but they look counterintuitive to a human eye, because we really want to develop this knight first to b6, then break with c5, and then keep this bishop until the diagonal opens further, so that we can put it on a meaningful square. Anyway. Bishop b2, knight b6, very cool, tuck tuck, bishop c3, and pawn c5. This break is absolutely imperative for black to play in order to restore the, the activity of the black pieces. It does come at the expense of creating an isolated pawn. However, as per discussed already a myriad of times on my channel, an isolated pawn by default is not a bad thing, nor is it a good thing. It's a thing, right? Like it's an occurrence on the chessboard that can be good or bad depending on the circumstances. But playing, not playing C5 on account of, whoa, I will be ending up with an isolated pawn is ridiculous. That's not an argument. An argument would be that white can trade seven pairs of pieces and outright I'm going to end up in an inferior endgame, therefore I'm not doing it. That's the argument. However, that is not the case. In fact, it seems to me that black has got, despite some ugly moves that we have to play, like rook a6, very, very good play. Uh, quite energetic play on the queen side and in the center, as will be demonstrated by Hikaru, continuously, in fact, um, here. Obviously, bishop f1 would... Uh, very well met by c4, shutting down the diagonal, creating a pass pawn there. No worries whatsoever. So takes was more or less mandatory. And queen b5. Firuja is trying to put some, turn on some heat on these pieces on the queen side. The alternative bishop f1, um, tickling the rook here doesn't quite cut it because I can simply pull back and the knight is not hanging yet. Later it will become a motif. Queen b5, queen c7, and rook c1, relocating the rook from b1 where it has done its duty to c1, trying to now hurt the newly developed queen on the c file. However, set queen has a marvelous square on a7. Now this looks like some real clumsy stuff, especially as far as the rook is concerned. But bear in mind that now we are looking down on the diagonal and f2 appears to be a little bit tender. Queen e2, immediately retreating. 
Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you something here. Queen b5, of course, was attacking the a5 pawn. And so when he kind of played queen c7, he needed to account for this. And of course, the idea was exactly what he played anyway in the game, which was queen a7 hitting the bishop and keeping an eye on this super delicious diagonal here. Capture is more or less forced. And after rook takes b6, now black gains fantastic counterplay. Look at these two bishops slicing and dicing both directions. That is some yummy stuff. A4 is hanging. All black pieces are in perfect squares. This is what you do not want to do with white. I mean, just look at the, the activity of the white pieces now. To turn this into this is nothing short of criminal activity on the chessboard. We basically sold grandma for a pawn. And that is no bueno. Now it's all about Black's activity, Black's threats, and uh, Black's initiative. So, yeah. Obviously, this was not on the cards for Firuja, who instead opted to keep some of the threats on and try to exploit the awkward placement of the Black pieces. And for the second time, he carries a remedy to the minor inconveniences. Throw a pawn in. We don't need them. Take it, friend, he says. And, of course, now the knight on c4 is insufficiently protected at first sight, but the fact of the matter is that queen c4 loses the f2 pawn. So that's entirely out of the question. So I try to justify this idea by playing rook a2, defending the pawn and threatening queen c4. But the engine politely pointed out to me that uh, pawns don't matter, friend. It's peace activity, which ironically is what I teach too, is what matters. And uh, it turns out that uh, white is already in extreme absolutely extreme trouble to hold a position because the c3 bishop is just too loose or the c1 rook depending on how you want to look at but the point is that we are threatening bishop takes f2 followed by rook takes c3 and due to the double firepower on the c file it is a nightmare to stop an absolute nightmare so yeah wowzers instead Firuji opted for knight b3 Bishop back to b6. And now I really do not mind black's position at all. Uh, the isolated pawn once again is neither here nor there. The pieces are remarkably active. All four minor pieces are on the board. This is just perfect. Queen a8, bishop g2, knight c5. And said piece activity keeps on improving. Um, now we need it to drop back. And by the way, here I don't like knight h4. It's a really yucky move considering the fact that white could have accomplished the exact same by centralizing the knight. Firuja, you need to put your pieces in the center. That's where they belong, buddy. Not on h4. And um, yeah, black goes on to hold. And here, some crazy complications are about to kick in. So watch this. g4. Obviously, that was, by the way, the idea with knight h4. Queen c8. Now we're threatening to penetrate on the back rank. Firuja says, no, thank you. We defend the pawns. They once again try to penetrate on f5. We now start hurting e5. Very logical chess. By the way, uh, you might feel that I'm going through this phase too fast, but so did the, uh, the players. Three minutes versus two. This is really, really the point, the end of the business. And by the way, despite the short time, the, the level of tactical, tactical awareness is mind-blowing. Watch this. Knight f5. Bishop takes, uh, actually no, the tactical awareness starts here with queen f4 because here black has g5, but it's met by queen f6, hello, but it's met by rook c6, hello, but we have got as many hellos as you like because now we have knight f5, hello, and that's a very feisty knight jump. Uh, where rook f6 in fact loses because after 98, uh, 97 check knight takes. Um, yeah, rook is hanging, knight is hanging in the end. At the very least, white is going to win several pawns, but probably more. Yeah, rook e6 is best and then take, take rook d5 is going to probably pick off this one as well. White is completely winning. And so, um, after a knight f5, probably best is bishop f5 and then we'll fizzle out into a drawish uh, position. So, 
until he Ferugia's tactical awareness served him perfectly well. There's a reason why I'm mentioning this. And now the game sort of fizzles into a very curious end game, which you would think should be a draw. Right? But there is a but here. And that but is, is that the white bone structure is nothing short of catastrophic. Um, double F pawns, um, overextended guy on E6, A4 is on the color of the bishop, H3 is on the color of the bishop. It's not pretty, right? It's holdable, it shouldn't be a drama, but it's definitely yucky. And more importantly, it is super easy to play with black. And it's really not easy to play for white. And the reason for that is, is because, let's just look at that after the trade, yeah? I have got one, two, and then depending on what happens after, three, four, five, six, super easy moves to play, right? So if I am uh, black here, I want to put the king on d6. Defending d5, I then can completely blockade the pawn on e6. Yeah? And if they defend it sufficiently, then I can start working on rerouting the knight to weak dark squares. My favorite is f4. So then I'm on route to here, which I can support with g5. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six moves. Right? That are almost guaranteed perfect. At least as far as planning is concerned. Good luck finding six coherent, obvious moves here for white. I can't even name one. I don't even know what white's next move is going to be after king e7, yeah? Like, I can delude myself that, ooh, I'm piling up on the weak. No, I'm not. I'm just helping black's plan. That's what this move is. And at this point, the white army has reached its maximum potential. And it's accomplished absolutely bugger all. Always, always a very concerning sign of your position when your pieces are operating at full functionality and they have accomplished zilch. Yeah. Also note that although the white king is not participating the same way how the black king does, it's also difficult to see how I could accomplish that. Because this king is not really ready to join the party, especially with the hanging e6 pawn. So, that was a big mantra about, you look at the eval bar, welcome to the eval bar where all drinks are free, uh, and it says 0 0.02 should be a dead draw. Yeah, nah. You need to sweat a lot with white here to get a draw. That's all I'm saying. Look, b2, very logical, trying to activate uh, on the b file. Rook c8, also very logical, trying to neutralize the active rook on the b. Knight e4, activating the knight, bishop d3, and knight c3. The engine likes to drop back to d6 here, cancelling out the check, covering b5, but knight c3 is a very human move going after the weak pawn on a4, f4, d4, and this is where the position becomes even more irrational than before, and again, by the way, a huge kudos to Hikaru for playing his g5. Now, to be fair, with the moves that he has played already, knight c3 and d4 in particular, he was forced to play g5 here, right? But to embrace this much um, imbalances in one position, that is next level. Because this... I mean, the lower level you go, the more people would think that this is almost winning for white, which is completely wrong, because although we have got the two connected passes, but they're completely blockaded. All pawns are currently sitting on white with a white bishop. That's already a tragedy. And uh, once again, it is super easy to build an extremely effective blockade, after which these pawns are no longer strength. They are li uh, liabilities, they are problems, there are things to look uh, look out for as far as white is concerned. No bueno. Um, and so, at this point, I really did not understand Firuja's decision making, up on time by the way, because here after rook d4, knight takes d3, rook takes d3, rook takes f5, we find ourselves in a four rook rook ending, which is basically a synonym for 
I am going to make a draw. Four of Crook Endings are a nightmare to play for a win because the drawing potential behind the four rooks is insane. Having said that, this would be a dead draw if we removed another pair of rooks as well. So I'm really confused why Firja did not opt for this scenario. Because he instead went with f6 check. And I can't even, I can't really comprehend this in any other way than an attempt to play for a win. And I think that the reason why all this happened is, is because he overlooked here rook f5, assuming that walking into this cover check is catastrophic. And the fact of the matter is, is that no, it's not. And once again, at this point, he still had a red hot go at making a super basic draw. Um, can I call it super basic? Maybe not anymore, because now I can't go after this pawn. Rook b3. Yeah, I think we have to sweat it now, but this was definitely a holdable endgame. Yeah, actually not. This is holdable. The engine says 0 0.8, but uh, 6, but um, that says nothing. In, at this point, you need to stop uh, looking at engine eval, and instead, it's a hint for those who like to use engine in order to understand at least who is doing what, you need to look into what winning plan does the engine offer here for black that justifies the favor, uh, the favoring outcome. And there is none whatsoever. So, there was a draw to be had still, but admittedly, e7 looked extremely tempting here. However, and once again, kudos to Hikaru. Now, after the exchange sack, this is absolute utter chaos. And to navigate this chaos, you need time. And time is very scarce. Hikaru played knight f4. And he once again, I would like to credit Firuja. He plays perfect chess. King f1, perfect. d3. King f2, perfect. Right? Now I can take the pawn with a check, but then the king moves down this pawn. Enough play for white to hold the draw. Takes. King e3. Perfect move. g4. And at this point, the engine yells at you a myriad of moves that hold the draw. But the logic behind these moves is really, really unclear. And you are facing three pawns running for touchdown. Your clock is ticking away, very annoyingly now. It is super easy to slip here. The reason why I'm surprised that Firuja did slip, and he did slip in an extremely ugly fashion, is because apart from Hikaru and Magnus, I would rate him as the ultimate god of speed chess, anything that has to do with doing anything on the chessboard under limited time, under increased pressure, that's Firuja with capital letters. And for all intents and purposes, he walks into a night folk here, like absolutely unbelievable. And that's it. Right? So I would not expect Firuja to do that in a bullet game. And I know it sounds harsh, but I'm comparing the man to his own standards. Right? Now, the draw that was to be found here was extremely difficult in the sense that the logic is completely lacking there. Because what White needed to recognize here was, was that Black essentially, right here, does not have a threat. What we want to do here is sit tight and wait for G3. And this seems so counterintuitive. So let me show you the line. According to the engine of pretty much any single move with the rook on the back rank draws, I'm going to show you rook A because this seems to create a threat. All right? G3. And here comes the shock. Rook A5 loses because it forces the king closer and it actually shoulders the white king away from that. So that makes no sense. But after king f3 double x clam, there is no win to be had for black. This is absolutely bananas. The reason for that is as follows. d2, and now you slide back with the rock. And then comes now the problem that there are two black pawns hanging. 
and we will have to part with one. Still not quite over yet. Watch. Check. King G3 and H5. And tada! Turns out that the pawn is immune because of another fork. Good luck calculating all of this when you have got 136 on the clock, yeah? King G2. Walking out of the fork situation. Knight E4. King F3. King E5. Allowing the check, but know that we won't be able to take the knight because of queen. King e2. Wait for it. It's not over yet. h4. Rook h8. And h3. And now we can't take this pawn. Because when we do, there is queen takes check. And we lose. Tada! This knight is one of the most agile monsters I've seen in a long time. Having said that, no threat on the black side. So all we need to do is hold. Just hold. King d4, king d1. We are still not threatening to take this because of the check, but nor is black threatening in any way to make progress because if they do mate threat, then we can now take the pawn with the check. And so black's best here is potentially... Um, some kind of a pass move, I whatever, you name it, like king d5, and then you just hold the h5. And there is no progress to be made. Now, is it fair to anticipate Firuja to calculate this in 136? No. But, is it fair to say that he still definitely should have tried to go down that path hoping that there was a draw there, rather than walking into this. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't want to hit him too hard for this, but this on his stand by his standards is absolutely unacceptable. I, I'm absolutely certain that he was absolutely devastated. I didn't see any footage. I didn't see any interviews. I'm coming in from cold, so I have no idea what's going on or what went down. But he literally just, after G3, he gave a check and then he called it quits. Which is all there was to it, because after rook g8, g2, this guy is promoting, or a rook is lost. So, a shocking finish to a really, really well-fought game. But I, first and foremost, would like to credit Hikaru, because the fighting spirit that he demonstrated throughout the game, and the various ways how he navigated this position so that it was always turning towards scenarios where the draw was on the cards... But so was the fact that he could push for a win. That was mwah, absolutely chef's kiss style of chess, um, you know, in this 2750 plus region where playing for a win with black is borderline impossible. And yet he managed to keep that result on the table and eventually score it. Kudos. And with that, ladies and gents, we are going to move on to Gukesh um, Abbasov, an equally tragic... <laughs> Uh, and equally marathon run, I'm going to cut this reasonably short. So, the opening was a Petrov, the definition of uh, I don't want to lose uh, with the black pieces, but um, yeah, interesting stuff here. With DE5, Knight takes E5 is the more popular choice here, and indeed, after Knight C5, Bishop E2, Abbasov equalized with laughable ease absolutely laughable ease in fact at certain points in the opening phase for example here optically i preferred black's position but uh, of course all this is more or less known to theory and here after bishop d3 um despite the fact that we have no central presence the e5 pressure is going to yield at least a slight edge to black. I would like to highlight here queen f6 as a beautiful idea. Now, of course, bishop takes, pawn takes, rook takes is not exactly optimal because this is on. This is also a motive, by the way. And if takes, then queen f3. So that's out of the question. c3 needs to be played. And now bishop f5 is perfectly fine. Now, once again, I look at this and I can't help myself but think that I prefer black. Um, but there is a difficulty here and that difficulty kicked in in a decision to whether to take this with the queen or the knight and Abbasov made a serious mistake here by taking with the knight. Queen takes back would have yielded a super easy equality for black because of rook e8. 
and now the masses of trades are going to lead to um, a super easy equal T, whereas knight e5 just blocks off all of our pieces, and after rook f6, whether it be rook e6 next or even tripling on the f file, black is beyond fine. Beyond fine. I really don't know what uh, Abasov's reason was for taking with the knight, but now white really did get a lot of stuff going on the e5. This is looking very depressing for black. The knight is glued to f5 because of the penetration on e7, and g4, as you will see soon, is by no means of the cards. As a matter of fact, here, g4 instead of c4 would have yielded substantial advantage to white. The idea is this, knight e6, rook e7, queen d8, queen g6, mate threat, rook f7, all this is completely forcing. And I'm nearly certain that Gukesh calculated it this far and he concluded that after queen g5, there was no advantage to be had. However, if you just look a half move further, this queen e6 pin actually turns the table. So it doesn't turn the tables. What it does is, is that it retains the advantage. Now the rook has no active square to go to. Knight f5 is going to come. Very tricky to get out of the pin. Um, overall, white retains uh, a tremendous pressure on the king side. But instead of this g4 move, uh, Gukesh opted for c4, allowing this pawn to move forward to d4, which certainly is not a problem by itself, but now he needed to navigate this position with utmost precision, and he didn't have the time for it. He's down to 10. Queen f7, rook e4, there was a fair bit of toing and froing here to win some time on the clock. Rook e4, rook d8, rook f4, perfect chess, d3, queen a4, still perfect chess. Queen a2, note that f5 is hanging, so if you go d2, um, then I can just come back here and now there is a fair bit hanging. And ultimately I will be able to uh, round up this pawn and capture it. Queen a2 is also very annoying, removing the queen from the pin, penetrating on the back rank, pushing the pawn. Uh, white has to be particularly careful here. King h2 was played. Note that, for example, if I take this, then we've got check, king here. Duck, duck, and d2. And that's not just a simply I'm threatening to get a queen, but additionally the rook is hanging too. So Gukash had to be careful here. King h2 was best. g6, queen b4 best. A very unique way to blockade the pawn, or to stop it at least. And here we missed g4. It's a marvelous idea that black had up his sleeve that d2, knight d2, queen c7 would create a parade of pins on the diagonal, but it turns out after knight f3, we are all a-ok. -okay. Now, what I think Gukesh may have overlooked, I don't know, it's a blind guess, is, is that it seems that knight h4 just kills us. Because this diagonal is just so overloaded with hanging pieces, right? So knight h4 and e5 is hanging for free. But that's not the end of the story. And I think that's exactly what went amiss here. That after knight h4, queen e5, knight takes g6. After all, it is white who laughs last. The line is not over. Knight takes, uh, sorry, rook takes f4. And the only winning move here for white is the sensational queen check and it turns out that queen d5 loses the queen. Wow. In any other case, after knight g6, if I just drop the queen back, we take, take, and white neutralizes the pin and goes on to win with superior material. Um, a bonkers, absolutely bonkers line. This is why you want to have more than 147 when you are on move 36, because this is where games are decided. And rook e1, whilst did not throw away the win, uh, it did compromise it a great deal. In fact, Abasov went on to equalize, believe it or not. And we found ourselves in this very messy position. Actually, the equalization is yet to come. I just realized that we are about to hit one of the most sensational positions of the entire candidates tournament so far. 
after rook g5. Why does a forced win here? By the way, I saw this posted today by Susan Porga uh, on Facebook, and I didn't realize it was from the, this game. I just recognized it when I loaded up the game. Why to move and win? Absolutely bonkers city. Um, Gukesh, he played knight e4, which is actually missing the win. So the idea here is, is that after queen takes c6, rook takes g2, check king f1 of all squares, holy moly, walking into a barrage of discovered checks for starters, none of them, by the way, doing enough damage. It turns out that white's threat, which is, by the way, the hardest thing to spot here, so once you spot it, you are good, uh, white's threat of, pause the video if you want to figure it out, rook e8 check followed by rook b8 followed by rook b7 is just terminal. And that's the only way to do it, right? So let's say I go rook h2, occasionally floating a mate idea, check. Can't take because it retakes with check, so there is no mate here, king g7, and rook b8. And now there is nothing to be done against rook b7. It is absolutely insane city. Knight d5, rook b7, Pinning the queen, by the way, rook f2 check, king e1, and we casually waltz out of uh, harm's way, and we win the game. If knight e7, I suspect we can take and take, but the engine prefers queen c3 check here, with the idea of queen e3 double attacking these boys. <laughs> like, whatever, Dr. Engine, whatever. So, yeah. And by the way, in case you are wondering why is it rook b8, why why not, for example, rook c8 with rook c7, the reason for that is it's because now we don't have a threat. So I just go here and... Oh, actually, no, I want to demonstrate it differently. Let's say... Oh, I wanted to say that rook c7, rook f2, and then knight d5 check, but of course that's garbage because the queen is hanging. That is not it. Okay, so what is it then? Rook h3, rook c7. Oh, I have check and take. Ha <laughs> ha! I just figured it out. Right. And that's why we need to be here. Because then when I take the rook, I'm still guarding the one on b7. It was deeper than I gave credit for. Wow. Anyway, Gukesh misses this. Admittedly, not one that he's going to sleep a lot of sleep over. Losing a lot of sleep over. But still... Uh, would have been a beautiful find. And now we are well and truly in uh, an equal territory. This queen ending shouldn't be winnable. But credit to the Indian. He pushes on. And I'm going to speed it up now like mad. Because I don't want to uh, bore you to death uh, with 25 moves of nothingness. So now eventually Gukesh gives up the H pawn to give way of the pawn and his own king. So now the race begins. Push, push, push. And at this point, we head for a very curious case of a queen ending when these queens will be replaced with two new ones. Ta-da! Let's have another go at this queen ending, shall we? Says Gukesh. Dead draw, by the way. But... There we come. There we are about to approach a position right now when there is one move, one legal move that holds the draw and everything else loses. If you want to try your hand, you can pause the video here. Um, unfortunately for Abasov, he went for the check and that immediately sealed the deal. The only draw was Queen G2. And with this, we are controlling a few vitally important squares as far as white's checking ability is concerned. And we are setting up for checks coming from this angle. And no matter what white does, black will be able to go on a checking spree and hold the draw. The drama is, is that after queen f4, uh, queen f4, queen f4, black runs out of checks. If they go from h3, then after king f6, no more checks and the mate threat will decide. And in the game, they went queen b5, but after queen e5, not only does this move block the check, but it sets up a discovered check. In fact, at this point, the engine already announces a mate in 16. 
believe it or not. And the reason for that is, is because once again, two made threats means that I have to go check. But now the counter check means that I can force the queens off. Which was done by check and uh, Abbasov resigned because after king h3, queen f5 check, the queens come off and the pawn is going to march in and white wins. A tragic loss for sure for the Azari. I still would like to credit him because he played a marvelous game. But at the very end, when it came down to the battles of the nerves, uh, Gukesh seemed to be just better poised and more focused. Once again, a real heartbreaker there for the Azari, but that's chess for you. Um, and with that, ladies and gents, we are going to call it a day for the recap of the fifth round. Um, thank you, everyone, for the kind words and the support. Please continue to comment down below uh, to make the algorithm like our videos even more. I will be able to cover two more videos before I travel, so I will be able to offer a bit more content. But as I said, I will uh, have to stop a little bit earlier than the tournament itself will. Nonetheless, I hope that you guys enjoy these videos. I will be back with the next soon. Don't forget to sub to like, to thank me, and to super thank me if you can. I will be back soon. Thanks for watching.